Awesome, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Um, this is gonna be a more of a regional scale talk than uh, what Tim just presented. And um, this is coming to you from Memorial University, which is underneath this star. So I'm gonna be specifically looking at the Newfoundland, Labrador and Irish Atlantic rifted margins. So a wee bit further north than what we've just been looking at. So this is a really interesting part of the world to look at um, because it encapsulates a number of magma poor rifted margins. As you are all likely aware, the best studied ones in the world are the Southeast Newfoundland and Iberian margins, but uh, the Northeast Newfoundland and part of the Labrador margin as well as the Irish margin are all non-volcanic or magma poor as well. Um, it's a really cool place because we've got failed rifts, we've got continental ribbons, we've got all sorts of stuff going on here. As well, it's a really cool place to look at inheritance because uh, as we move out of the Variscan affected domains, we hit into the areas that um, were seeded by the structures from the Appalachian Caledonian orogenies. And you can see here, this is the projection of where we think they go offshore, but you can see closing this ocean makes for a really messed up puzzle because the, th the pieces don't quite line up, they've been chewed up. Um, so it's a really cool place to kind of see how these things have affected um, subsequent rifting. So what I'm going to focus on mostly today is this uh, continent ocean transition zone. So going from the proximal domain of um, lightly extended continental crust through the necking domain where we've got uh, the, uh, the thinning, the abrupt thinning of the crust, eventually getting to hyperextension where you are typically going to see serpentinized mantle at depth, possibly with exhumation of that mantle, and then trundling into embryonic oceanic crust before hitting the real deal when you get at the far extent. Now, when it comes to imaging this kind of thing in depth, um, in terms of getting this sh shallower structure, the best go-to is reflection data uh, because you're able to get really, really high resolution images of the sedimentary sequences as well as the tilting of the fault blocks. Reflection data though sometimes falls short of being able to capture the moho unless you have a really nice contrast there. Um, and it's incapable of directly um, informing whether you have serpentinized mantle or not. For that, we really need refraction wide angle reflection methods. Um, and those are really the go-to method for finding out where the moho is, trying to work out where the necking is happening, and if you have exhumed mantle. Now, just as a reminder, most people already know this, but multi-channel seismic reflection data generally involves a boat dragging its own source and its own receivers with the, uh, the streamers uh, containing a number of receivers along them. Uh, and basically, you're looking for bounces off subsurface later, layers. Um, the offsets that you can capture are completely a function of the length of that streamer. By contrast, refraction or wide angle reflection profiling methods are logistically more nightmarish because you have to put your receivers, your OBS on the seafloor, uh, but then you have complete freedom to take your source wherever you like. And that allows you to capture much, much, much longer offsets and capture not only the bounces, but the energy that's moved laterally through the crust and the mantle and will give you some information about velocities. So the way I tell this to my students, I say, Multi-channel reflection methods are essentially looking at the structures. They're giving you the outlines of your uh, coloring book figures, but they don't really tell you what colors to use for your actual drawing. Meanwhile, uh, war methods, seismic reflection refraction methods, give you a blurrier image, but they give you some sense of what the colors should be. So in an ideal world, you have both of these things and you wind up having this really nice colored picture of your subsurface that you can then interpret. Um, the savvy amongst you would say, of course, that you obviously can get reflection, uh, rather velocity information from reflection surveys. That's true. Um, but that resolution and velocity is going to de decrease as a function of depth. And that resolution is completely dependent on the length of your, of your streamer. So if you have a short streamer, you're only going to have some resolving power for your shallow velocities. Um, and you'll never be able to equate what you can get from more surveys. So that's why they're so very valuable. Now, I'm gonna do an overview of the war lines acquired since the 1970s. This is more or less comprehensive, but if, you, if your favorite line is missing, uh, hopefully you won't be too offended. Now I am specifically omitting everything in Iberia, which is sacrilegious when we're talking about uh, magma poor margins, but I really wanna do focus on these areas that are less looked at in the, in the literature. So this is a plot of all the war lines acquired between 1970 and 2020 uh, for the Newfoundland, Irish, and uh, Labrador margins. And you can see uh, it's not too, too bad. It's got some decent coverage here. The uh, green and the orange lines were acquired in the last 20 years. And those are gonna be the ones with the highest OBS spacing and the best quality uh, velocity models. 
And you can see there's quite a few less of those. Um, what I want to contrast this with to you is the recent acquisition of reflection data, mostly by industry. Um, and just uh, to give you a sense of how uneven this, this balance is between reflection and refraction methods. So these are the data lines acquired by TGS and PGS over the last 10 years over the Newfoundland Labrador uh, margins. Uh, it includes mostly 2D lines in yellow, but there are also, also a number of 3D surveys that are a massive, massive, massive in scope shown here in red. Now, the listening times for these surveys were about nine seconds. So they're really quite good at imaging the shallow structure, not so much the deeper structure, but the coverage is insane. And so you can really do really detailed studies using these data sets if you can get access to them. Therein lies the rub. Uh, another data set that has recently been acquired is by ION, um, and these are the Labrador span, Nova span, and Grand span surveys. These ones are cool because they specifically listened even longer so you can get the full crustal section, and there's some really nice MOHO images coming out of that data set. Again, getting access to this is not necessarily obvious. On the Irish margin in 2013 and 2014, the government uh, paired up with ENI to acquire an extensive data set here. Again, this is similar to the TGS PGS data set in that the listening times are more akin to looking at the shallower structure, but still, um, this is coverage like we haven't seen before, uh, although it's not terribly good at giving you the deeper, deeper structure. Now, this is your coverage for reflection lines, and this is what your coverage is for refraction lines. Uh, it gets even worse. If you want to be just looking at the ocean continent transition, which is what I want to look at specifically, this is what you're kind of limited to. These are the lines that you can use to kind of figure out how you're going to um, interpret your reflection data. So if you think of this, this is your coloring book. This is the structures in your coloring books, and these are our crayons. So we don't have quite enough crayons to do uh, as nice a job as I would like to see in terms of characterizing the ocean continent transition along these boundaries. Um, I'm now going to do a little bit of tour of some of these lines. I'm actually, it turns out it's chronological, although that was not the original intent, to kind of see what some of the insights uh, that have been derived from these data sets uh, have been. So starting off in the Labrador Sea, uh, there's a nice pairing of lines here that were published in 1995 by Ping Chan. Um, and these ones revealed asymmetric rifting where you had very, very abrupt crustal necking on the Greenland side with more gradual necking on the Labrador margin. There were zones of uh, serpentinized mantle detected on both sides that are roughly about 100 kilometers wide. Um, and those appear to be symmetric, which shows that when you got to the serpentinization process, that was a symmetric process across the two. Um, from these models, it's not that clear that there's ex exhumation that has taken place. Although later work by Charlotte Keene and others um, looked at these velocities again and looked at some of the PGS, TGS reflection data and argued that uh, there may well be exhumation here. But it's not definitive. We certainly don't have drilling. Um, and the velocities are non-unique enough that it's not clear, but there may well be exhumation going on here. If we jump to the uh, Irish margin, um, this is the only line that goes from the rock all into the uh, ocean continent transition. Um, this was the Rapids 2 line. This one showed a really abrupt transition from the continental crust from the Rockall Basin into oceanic crust. That's kind of a function of the OBS coverage, which got poorer when you got at the seaward end of things. Um, and you can't really say much about uh, the uh, proximal domain here because we're running down the middle of the basin. But this is a, a, a one constraint that we have that shows that we do have this old fashioned view of continent right against um, oceanic crust. These data were also looked at by Brian O'Reilly, who looked at them a little bit more deeply and resolved a lower upper mantle velocity layer, which was interpreted as serpentinized mantle. But sadly, the, um, the coverage from the OBS did not allow for that interpretation to be taken further offshore. In 20, sorry, 2005, Tim Minchel and uh, Bullock published this paper. Um, this was, this is argued, this is in fact the only velocity model, uh, modern velocity model that can be used to interpret the ocean continent transition offshore Ireland. Uh, and this was a great paper because it was the first evidence for a wide zone of, zone of exhumed serpentinized mantle shown here between uh, continental crust and oceanic crust. Prior to this model being published, it was believed that it was a really sharp contrast from continent to ocean which is in contrast to what we already know on the Iberian margin, where we know we have a wide zone of exhumed mantle. So this is the, the only evidence, the only velocity evidence, but it gives us some faith that there's some uh, 
serpentinization and exhumation of mantle on the Irish margin. Now, if we jump across to the other side, there is one refraction line going off the northeast margin of Flemish Cap, and this was published by Joanna Gerlings in 2011. This one shows a very abrupt necking zone going from 30 kilometer thick crust to something less than 10 kilometers over a lateral distance of about 50 kilometers. Um, in terms of the transition zone, it looks like it's continental crust thinned, hyperextended continental crust over a slightly serpentinized zone underneath. Um, we can contrast this somewhat with another line that was acquired off the southeast margin of Flemish Cap by Thomas Funk, shown here. Uh, and this one has some things in common, but some stark differences. The transition zone, the necking zone rather, is a lot more gradual on the southeast margin than it is on the northeast margin. And there's definitely a lot more serpentinization of mantle going towards Iberia rather than going to towards Ireland um, to the northeast. And then the last line we have, this one is one that I published this year, looking at a line going across the Orphan Basin and just tickling across the continent ocean transition. Um, uh, what I would have given for more OBS further out uh, is beside the point. This gives a really interesting complex structure across the Orphan Basin, where we have some really abrupt necking going in right off of the continental shelf into this zone that's been interpreted as a failed rift. Um, and then we wind up getting this thicker crust here, continental likely in nature, uh, a classic H block as uh, Gwen Perron Pinvidic's definitions would say. Uh, but then when we get to the continent ocean transition, it's really not that clear what's going on. The velocities are too high for oceanic crust in some places, there is some evidence for perhaps a pentonization of the upper mantle, but it's very, very limited. Um, and so we really don't have a clear picture here, um, whether A, we have serpentinized mantle, and B, whether it's exhumed or not. So if we take those limited crayons, if you will, to try and understand the deeper structure, um, we can say some things about the necking gradient. Um, here I've shown G for gradual and S for sharp. Um, you can see asymmetry here, but when you get into this area here, where again, this is where all those Appalachian Caledonian trends go through. It's not really clear how those pre-existing structures or the rift dynamics uh, segmented the style of, of rifting or, or necking particularly. In terms of all of these surveys, they all show that there's serpentinization of mantle, which is good because that's what we expect. And that's definitely what we've seen uh, Southeast Newfoundland and it's been drilled as well as here on the Iberian margin where it's been imaged and drilled. Um, and it definitely seems like that is a common theme for all of these uh, magma pore margins uh, going further north. In terms of the exhumation story, that's a harder one to convince. It, as I said, it's drilled here, it's drilled here. Um, Tim's model shows that it's likely happening here. We don't have any, any evidence for exhumation in the rock all. And these two refraction lines are not giving us definitive evidence that there's exhumation. And again, here, the original velocity models are not definitive on this. Uh, and you can kind of infer it from reflective character, but until we get more modern surveys up here, we're not gonna be able to say for sure. So my main conclusion is that we need way more wide angle profiling along these margins. We need more crayons so that we can color in our coloring book. Um, there's been so much emphasis on these multi-channel reflection data sets. Uh, and I think industry is, is, is not so clear on necessarily the value of refraction, but we really, really need these extra constraints at depth. Until we get those, we're kind of stuck with using whatever constraints we can get from these wide angle profiles and use them with other approaches. My classic approach is being, trying to do some gravity inversion results and then inferring crustal thicknesses from those. Now those are great for figuring, figuring out necking and, and mapping that along the different margins, but it tells you nothing about whether you've got serpentinized mantle or whether it's uh, exhumed or not. So we're, we're still missing that dimension. Thankfully, with these kinds of models and with the constraints brought in by refraction modeling or wide angle reflection pro profiling, we can confirm whether these, these necking domains make sense, and then we can put them into plate models. This is just showing those on a rigid reconstruction, but now we can actually play with deformable ones. And that's going to give us that extra dimension to make up for the fact that we really got some sparsely constrained margins. And that's all I was going to say. So if there's any questions, please don't hesitate. And if you want to email me later, you can certainly do so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. That's great. So we've just had a question from uh, Brandon Shook. Brandon, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, thanks, Kim. That was a really interesting talk. I was wondering, you had um, a place where you had a sharp, um, pretty close to a gradual continent ocean transition. I was wondering yep. if that kind of crossed any pre-existing terrain boundaries or if there was any evidence of structural inheritance kind of affecting that um, sharp spatial changes 
Um, that one was res with, with uh, respect to Flemish cap, which is this guy here. Yeah, now Flemish cap is an interesting duck because he likely uh, used to be over here and has been rotated out. So uh, this uh, continental ribbon has experienced very different tectonism on its different margins. Um, and so inheritance plays a role in, in causing this guy to swivel out in the first place. Um, and that's being manifested or shown by the variations in how that, uh, that necking zone is, is manifesting itself. But I don't think that the, the inheritance itself is what's dictating that, uh, that difference. I think the difference is coming from, it's secondary. The inheritance causes the rotation and the rotation results in these different necking uh, profiles. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Anybody else have a question? Feel free to text or just shout out now. It's an open question session. While you're thinking, I just had a question, Kim. Yep. So in, in your view, you know, it was very striking, this difference between all of the multi-channel lines and how few wide angle lines there are. Going forward, what do you think is our best bet? Is it to try and convince industry that this is an important data set that they should acquire? Or do we need to maybe work together in more international um, projects to get lots of OBSs out, maybe to do very high resolution surveys like Tim was showing, presumably that's gonna be a really big international effort rather than kind of one group. What do you think? That would be totally, totally awesome. Um, to the prior point though, this line here, see there's one I didn't talk about, uh, it's Northwest Southeast. That one was actually fully funded by Exxon Mobil oh, right. and Dalhousie University did it. And then what they did, it's a high resolution OBS line where they actually redeployed the OBS three times. Um, that's unprecedented. So the right. industry paid for that refraction line entirely and gave the data with no strings attached to wow. ac academia. Now, if the um, COVID could end and we can go back to normal, then we could perhaps approach companies about doing this again. But uh, that's one option, but yeah, international collaborations would be fantastic on this too. What, out of interest, what was Exxon's motivation for doing that? What were they, did they tell you what particular part they were interested? I think it was mostly they wanted to have the constraints in order to interpret their broader data sets. Because the data sets I showed you, those are, mul those are multi, um, they're, they're, they're shot and then sold to companies. But the companies themselves also do their own independent acquisitions. And I think they wanted to have the deeper constraints. So see, they supposedly ha must have had a geophysicist on board who saw the value in, uh, in getting more crayons, if you will, um, and, and convinced the higher ups that they should invest in that. Right. But more of that would be absolutely yeah. brilliant. But I, I do find a lot of industry people just, they don't, they don't understand refraction. They don't understand its benefits. And so it's not on their, rad their radar at all. We've got a question from uh, Laurie uh, Whitesell. Laurie, are you there? Are you there, Laurie? Otherwise I can read out your question. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, hello. Uh, I was just curious, uh, we have a, you know, data shown that uh, is, uh, I was curious if there are uh, additional lines that go uh, farther to the north and east to see if we can't uh, uh, compare uh, farther up along the uh, northeast trend. Uh, on which margin are you talking about? Newfoundland? No, the, the northeast Atlantic. It's uh, up uh, by like uh, the Norwegian Sea and, and areas in that area. Oh, there, there are lines up there. I've, com I've completely ignored those. There's actually a, a quite an extensive atlas that's been developed by most of the surveys up there. And, and uh, Thomas Funk has compiled all the refraction lines up there. And there, there are a great deal, a great deal more up there. Um, but I've ignored those because they're magma rich margins. Okay. 